All right, part two of uh, our training for evangelism. I was just talking to somebody in the interim about the best kind of relational evangelism and how sometimes friendship evangelism really isn't evangelism. It's just friendship. But the most genuine, obvious, uh, real friendship evangelism is when you share the truth at great cost. When that relationship is actually put at risk because you're willing to share the truth in the most sensitive and, and emotionally invested relationships of your life. So I, I want to warn you, you might see someone who seems very bold on the street and I, and I wonder at final judgment how that person might be signed up, sized up where they might be really weak with respect to being willing to share the truth in a relationally costly environment. Um, so, you know, I might shine in one area and might not in another. And uh, someone might seem really gentle and kind in a relational context, but when the risk uh, presents itself, they choose not to share the truth. So... I like to tell people over and over again, evangelism is less like seminary and more like Sunday school. And while I'm very thankful for some of the most dramatic encounters you'll find on YouTube with people who are really good communicators and they know the truth, 98% of evangelism in reality is very boring. Uh, it's very not dramatic. By, by boring, I mean by worldly standards. It's very simple. It's very repetitive. It doesn't work well on TV because it's not fast-paced. Most evangelism on the street with strangers is very slow-paced and kind. It just doesn't work well with uh, video equipment, usually. Uh, it's, it's, when it's genuine, it's, you're investing in people maybe in a matter of minutes, but you're doing hard things that don't look very attractive to the world. And you're sharing not uh, uh, upper, upper college-level, graduate-level information, you're typically sharing Sunday school level information, very basic gospel truths with people who don't quite understand things. And so it's very humbling for an evangelist who loves doctrine and theology and study and the Puritans and the Reformers and the early church fathers and Greek and Hebrew, and you hit the street. And you're back to talking about John 3.16 and Ephesians 2.8 and 9. Most evangelism is very simple very repetitive. In that spirit, let me give you the tools that I use. If you were to hang out with me for an hour doing evangelism, you'd probably hear these conversation starting questions over and over and over again. So it's not very hard. You, you'll, you'll pick up on this. Um, you could, if, you just, if you could memorize maybe a half dozen of these, they would serve you well. So when I'm on the street and I'm, I, I feel naked without my tracks, I like to hand something out and I like to uh, extend my hand and, and say, where are you from? Can I give you one? This is very simple. Uh, where are you from? What's your faith background? Uh, can I explain the tract to you? Do you go to church anywhere? What's your religious background? Um, my name's Aaron. I'm a born-again Christian. We're out here sh sharing the truth about Jesus. Or we'd love to talk to people about Jesus. How are you doing today? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? I love asking these following questions. Uh, where did you go to high school? Where are you from? Where do you work? Um, did you serve a mission here in Utah? Uh, Mormons will often serve a one and a half to two year mission. And for many young adults, this is a kind of uh, life changing maturation seasonal transition time of their life, where they're out of the house, typically just outside of the house. They're just they're like kids. They're just like kids. They're so young these days. Um, but it's a time where they get to travel somewhere, interesting perhaps. They get to tell you where they went. Um, they, they were able to uh, live with some young men and be on mission together, and study scriptures together. It's a very important part of their life. Where'd you go? Where'd you go on your mission? So here, you'll see where I'm going with this. If I ask someone, uh, where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to high school? Um, 
I'll ask things like, have you ever met a born-again Christian before? My, my name's Aaron, I'm an evangelical, or I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Protestant Christian. I'm a mainstream Christian. Choo choose your, your, your label. Uh, have you ever met a born-again Christian before? Or uh, did you ever have any born-again Christian friends growing up? And this is, starts to get very useful to me, to get to know someone, where they're from, what they do, where they grew up. And I get to start understanding whether or not they've had any relational connections with believers. Right? Have they ever been in interaction with other believers? Did they have any born-again Christian friends? Now in Utah, this is super heart-stirring because you'll talk to people and they'll say, no, I never have. I never had a, an evangelical friend growing up. So, I mean, that, that should make you pause. Go, wow. Like, I grew up in the church. I grew up in Sunday school. I got to go to Awana. We did Bible quizzing. I had family and friends pouring into me. I had youth uh, pastors. I had preaching pastors. I had, I had all sorts of people pouring themselves into me. I had friends in youth group. Wow, I, I was just given a, a Thanksgiving feast of influences. And I'm talking to someone who's never had a born-again Christian friend before. So that should just stir your heart up. If they say yes, they have had a born-again Christian friend, I like to ask, did you ever get to talk about faith or doctrine? Have you ever had any interesting religious discussions with your Christian friends? And if they say yes, I, I like to ask, well, what did you talk about? And you'll see here my agenda, which hopefully is very clear, is I want them to take existing conversations with Christians that they've already had, and I want to build on those, right? I want to work with and upon the efforts of other Christians. I don't want to make friends with unbelievers by throwing believers under the bus. Have you ever seen people do that? Where they try to get chummy with an unbeliever by saying, I'm not like those Christians. I'll be nicer, you know, or I'm, I'm one of the better kind. I want to take the best interactions they've already had with other Christians and see if there's a topic that they already have in mind that we can work with. So I want them to introduce topics and put them on the table. What did you talk about? What do you think about that? Right? What's your understanding of that? Um, how would you describe the difference on that topic between what you believe and what historic Christians believe? Go at it from a different angle here in Utah. Where did you go on your mission? Were you ever able to talk to any born-again Christians on your mission? Often, the answer is yes. Uh, what did you talk about? See what I'm doing again? Uh, I want them to take those topics and put them on the table. Um, I, want, I want to work with them. Um, what, did you, what do you think about that? Uh, what's your understanding of that? Have you ever heard a born-again Christian present a case for that before? Do you understand what Christians believe about that? Often we're thinking, oh, I need, to, I need to debate, and that might be a, an actual need for the moment. Don't, don't, don't throw that under the bus. That can be a, a valid need to debate. But often the people we're talking to just don't know what we believe. They, they have very sad misconceptions about even the, the fact that we believe in the physical resurrection. Many people in Utah aren't even aware that we believe in the physical resurrection of the body. Or they think uh, the Trinity consists of a kind of uh, modalism, or you know, uh, they, they, mis they misconstrue basic Christian beliefs about grace. What's your understanding of what we believe about that? Um, so you, you see where I'm going with that. I want them to talk about existing conversations, existing relationships. I want to see if I can get them to talk about existing topics they have in mind that they've already spoken about. I want them to put those on the table and work with those. Two of the questions I often ask on the street are, what would you say uh, are the biggest differences between your faith, say, the biggest differences between uh, what Mormonism teaches and what historic Christianity teaches, or mainstream Christianity, or evangelical Christianity? What would you say are some of the biggest doctrinal differences between uh, your belief system or your church and what historic Christians teach. 
And you kind of have to coax that out sometimes because they'll maybe say something superficial or say like, well, actually we're quite similar and you know, we, we, we only vary on unimportant things. Or you know, we have much more in common, they'll say, than, than, than uh, you know, dissimilarities. Uh, so I, I'll just kind of press that. Well, you know, what else? What else do you think most divides us? What most differentiates your, uh, your faith and our faith? What's your understanding of some of the biggest differences? And if they give you kind of uh, weak answers to that, you can just say, interesting. What else? It's really simple. And if they give you something interesting to work with, you can work with it. And you can go from there to the gospel. That's really where we're going here. I want them to put topics on the table. What do you think are the biggest differences? What have you already spoken about with other Christians? The other main question I ask, this is my uh, billion dollar question, is have you, have you ever heard a born again Christian summarize the gospel before? It's very simple, and this works with anybody. Have you ever heard a Christian summarize the gospel before? I love that question. It simplifies everything. Even if we have a lot, to, a lot of ground to cover, even if we have to do some deconstructing of bad ideas that they have, can we at least get there first? Have you ever heard a born-again Christian summarize the gospel before? I love the question because it's a win-win either way. If they say yes, you can ask, what did they say? And I get to hear them explain the gospel as they remember it. Right? Maybe it was an excellent gospel presentation, but they only heard it piecemeal or they heard it weekly. Um, what did they say? What's, what's your understanding of the evangelical gospel? And if they give you an interesting you know, presentation, of, huh, that's interesting. Well, that's not quite right, but or... Yes, that's great. That's what we believe. If they say yes, you say, what did they say? If they say no, they have never heard the gospel summarized before by a born-again Christian, I get to pause and think, this is probably the most important conversation this person will have up until, their, up until this moment. This is the most important conversation this person will have ever had in their life. And it softens your heart, hopefully. It stirs you, it provokes you to compassion. This person, to their memory, maybe they've heard it 10 times and they can't remember it, any of it. But to their memory, they've never heard a summary of the gospel before. If they say no, they've never heard it before. I get to ask, may I? And that gets me, that gets me so far in so many of these conversations. Evangelism has become very simplified for me over the years. May I? Uh, if they look like they're in a hurry, may I share for a few minutes? May I summarize the gospel for you in a few minutes? No. Okay, well, can, would you like to take one? Have a nice day. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, if they seem like they're super curious or interested or patient, they might give me five to ten minutes, maybe more, to share the gospel. So this is where the bread and butter of evangelism comes in. This is where the meat and potatoes of the evangelist uh, experience comes in. Our pleasure, our joy in recounting, in rehearsing the greatest news of all history, of all of reality. Better than Netflix, way better than Marvel, way better than Chronicles of Narnia, the gospel. This is the best news in the whole world. And if I, if I, have, had, if I have had a terrible week with relational conflict, with my own sin, with my own discouragement, with my own friction, with my own depression, I don't know, with my own bad week, and I'm on the street, and I get to share the gospel, there's at least one person benefiting from this. That's me, because I need to hear it over and over again. And if I'm with other believers and we're rehearsing the gospel one more time, that's encouraging. I'm happy. Well. God created you. He made you. He fashioned you. He created Adam from the dirt. He made Adam and Eve, and he put them in a garden that was beautiful. It was Edenic. It was perfect. And he gave them very simple instructions. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve disobeyed God. 
they rebuffed the wisdom and goodness of God and they transgressed against God. They, we use religious language that others are less used to. So I like to say they were unethical. You tell lost people they're sinners, they shrug. You tell them they're unethical and they go, oh, yeah, you, you are dark. You are, well, Adam and Eve, they, they, they disobeyed God. And what happened after this was that humanity, in spite of God's goodness, descended into a darkness. Humanity became very corrupt and dark. There was like a spiritual poison or a cancer, a power of corruption within humanity. But God made a promise. God said someday he would give an offspring, a descendant, a child of Eve, a great, great, great grandson of Eve that would someday crush the skull of Satan. He would crush the head of Satan, and yet this offspring's heel would be bruised. So you scratch your head and think, what, what is he talking about? And throughout the Old Testament, God kept adding more promises that someday he would bless all the nations through this man named Abraham. All the nations would be blessed through him. And that someday a greater prophet would come, a prophet like Moses, but greater than Moses. Someone who would give us um, a new covenant, a new heart. God told the people of Israel, if you keep my commandments, I will bless you. If you break my commandments, I will curse you. And when that happens, someday I will regather my people and I will give you a new covenant and I will write my law in your heart and I will forgive your sins God kept adding to his promises. Someday there would be a king, a descendant, a grandson, a great-great-grandson of David who would be David's Lord. Scratch your head. What? What? Someday there's going to be a grandchild, a descendant of David who's David's boss, who's David's Lord, who's David's God. Someday God's going to gather all of his people and he's going to give them a king like David, a prophet like Moses, an offspring who would crush Satan, someone who is a suffering servant, pierced for our transgressions, someone who is born of a virgin, someone who is the ancient of days. 2,000 years ago, this offspring was born of a virgin. He entered into the world under very humble circumstances. And he didn't talk like anyone else, first of all. Uh, there, was, uh, there was, I love storytelling in evangelism. There was once uh, some men who were sent to arrest Jesus in the Gospel of John. And they came back to the religious authorities. And the religious authorities said, why didn't you arrest him? And they said, well, he doesn't talk like other people. He doesn't talk like other people. Uh, Jesus showed he had all authority over life and death. He could touch a leper. And instead of becoming unclean, Jesus stayed clean and the leper became clean. He was healed. Jesus could forgive a person's sins by saying, your son, your sins are forgiven. And the authorities would say, only God has the authority to forgive sins is sort of true, which, which is true, right? And Jesus would say, I know what you're thinking, to show you that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins on earth. He, Jesus says, what's, what's, by the way, what's harder, what's easier to do, to say to a man, your sins are forgiven, or to say to a paralyzed man, get up, take up your mat, and walk. And Jesus looks at this man and says, get up, take up your mat, and walk. And this man walked right on out. The demons were terrified of Jesus. They said, Jesus, have you come to torment us before the appointed time? And Jesus would just say, go. And they would rush out of these demon-infested men and enter into pigs and drown in a lake. And people would beg Jesus to leave town. This is nuts. Well, Jesus exercised all authority. He went up on a mountain like Moses. And he delivered a law called the Sermon on the Mount. And he spoke with such penetrating moral clarity to matters of the heart. And he said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, 
you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus taught us to obey God from the heart, and he exposed our sin. He said, what you eat into your mouth goes into your belly, and it just goes right back out. But what comes out of your mouth comes from your heart, and issuing from the heart comes all manner of evil. Jesus said, unless you are born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus doesn't talk like others, and he has authority that we don't have. He says, he's from above, we're from below. Jesus, this very Jesus, went on purpose up to Jerusalem, knowing he would be executed. And as though a common, not a common, as though a, a, a shameful, publicly embarrassed criminal, Jesus was executed as though shamed, as though a sinner, as though worthy of our, as, uh, worthy of our ridicule. And he was mocked. And he was pierced and crucified. Now, that might be a, an interesting story if it stopped there, but Jesus was taken down from the cross and buried in a tomb purchased by a man named Joseph of Arimathea. And three days later, his disciples go to the tomb. The women go to the tomb. They look inside, and the tomb is empty. And my friend, you might not believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but you have to explain this. Why was the tomb empty? What happened? Did they steal the body? Did they fake his death? What's going on? The tomb is empty. And the disciples declared to the world that Jesus had physically appeared to them. And Jesus had invited them to touch his hands and to feel the wounds. And they ate, they ate fish with Jesus. This man who had died ate fish with his disciples. And this Jesus said he was coming back someday to judge the living and the dead. And so the million dollar question is, will I be right with God when Jesus returns? Now I have a, that awful problem, that sin problem, that guilt problem. I ought to go to hell forever and I am under the power of Satan, apart from Christ. So I have this twofold problem. I have the guilt of sin and I have the power of sin. And if Jesus were to come back and judge me, he would rightly find me guilty. And if you said, that's okay, Aaron, Jesus knows your heart, I'd say, that's a terrible problem <laughs> because all the worst things about me come from my heart. My heart is not an asset, it is a liability. My heart. Uh, has violated its conscience and violated God's law and hurt people unimaginably so many times. I can't even fathom the ways I've most deeply hurt the people in my life. So if I were to be judged by the Ten Commandments, by my, even my own conscience, by God's moral law, at final judgment, I am in bad shape. I deserve to go to hell. But here's the good news. Jesus says, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me. This man has passed from death to life. He has eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So my friend, I'm speaking to here, this Jesus someday, you will meet face to face, and you will have to reckon with him, because he will reckon with you. He, you will have to give an account for your life, and he will judge you. Jesus has the authority to throw you in hell forever, and he has the authority to forgive your sins. And he has accomplished a final sacrifice wherein Jesus was the curse for our corruption, for our unethical, evil, dark, cancerous corruption, our awful depravity. Jesus was cursed on our behalf. So, if you want to have your sins forgiven, if you want to be right with God, you need to trust in Jesus who forgives sinners. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus has raised from the dead, you will be saved. So, where do we go from here? I just gave you a five-minute gospel presentation, and I've, I've shared that a lot, right? So you're like, okay, I, don't, I can't do that. Well, here's what you can do. You can practice. 
Uh, and this, here's where you can uh, be awkward for the Lord's sake. Um, with your friends, with your family members, with uh, husband-wife devotions, with friendship group, or with the street in practice. Uh, here's, here's, a, here's an assignment for you. Here's a homework assignment for you. Practice sharing the gospel in increasing increments of time. Say 30 seconds. If I only had 30, really evangelists will share the gospel even if they only have 30 seconds? Oh, you betcha we will. We'll pack it in as best as we can. So start with, can I summarize the gospel in two or three sentences? Because sometimes someone is drunk or strung out or mentally incapacitated. Sometimes people need to hear it really simple. Sometimes people need to hear, you are a sinner and Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. If you call upon the name of Jesus, you will be saved. People need to hear that. Maybe you need to say that over and over again with someone who's not able to carry a good conversation. And maybe you could expand that to a minute. Right? This is a tangible uh, homework assignment if you're willing to do this. Practice sharing short-term gospel summaries. And if you're able to go to the streets with us, you'll get lots of practice. Have you ever heard the gospel summarized before by a born-again Christian? Yes. Well, what did they say? No. May I share it with you? And just try to go for a few minutes. See how, you know, gauge attention spans. What do you think about that? What are you going to do with that information? If you were to die tonight, where would you go? Heaven or hell? So that's, that's the uh, call to action. That's the one, two calls to action today. One is to practice summarizing the gospel. And I'm hoping you've picked up some conversational questions that you can gear your con aim, uh, steer your conversation toward sharing that. And then God will take that conversation perhaps in a different direction where you can expand on it or deal with false ideas that are blocking them from understanding the gospel and you could help them with those issues and correct those issues. The other call to action that I have uh, discovered to be very fruitful, because I've given this call to action in years past, is to take one of the four Gospels and to indulge yourself in it, to voraciously and gluttonously uh, eat it up. To, uh, there's different ways to do this. An audio Bible, for example. Um, you can get a good audio Bible that you like and say, pick the Gospel of Mark, pretty short. Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of John. Luke's kind of long. People don't pick that. If you want to do extra credit, go for Luke. Pick one of the four and eat it up for a whole year. All right? Just st start date, end date. And just try to, on maybe on your commute, just imbibe on that. Just, it's, like, it's like a hike that you take over and over and over again. You start to know it like the back of your hand. You start to know the contours of it. You start to internalize the stories of one of the four Gospels. I have given this call to action before, and a year or two or three later, I've had young adults come back to me and say, I did it, and it was so fruitful. Thank you so much, it, not just for evangelism, but for my walk with the Lord. I got to know the Lord Jesus Christ better. Now, with respect to evangelism, you realize, don't you, those were the instructional evangelistic manuals of early Christians, right? That's their evangelistic material. If they want to get someone excited about Jesus, that's the stuff they shared. Those are the Jesus stories that they would share. I remember uh, listening to a, uh, a missionary uh, who um, served in the Middle East. And he said that uh, with his wife and kids, they had a, like a list of all the different Jesus stories uh, on their fridge. And they would just go down the different Jesus stories and they would practice rehearsing, sharing, uh, thinking about reviewing Jesus stories. And what they would do is they would go out into the village and they would do what? They would share Jesus stories, right? So the, the goal here is to know the sayings of Jesus and the works of Jesus and to take those into your heart, internalize them, enjoy them, and then to bubble them out to, into your evangelism. What does this look like? 
practically. So I'll give you a clear example. In Utah, there is a tremendous interest in this topic called authority. Where do you get your authority? You get your authority. That's, that's a really good question, actually. That's not a bad question. Um, that's, a, that's a God question, right? Like, authority ultimately comes from God, right? We, we should care about whether or not we are authorized to do or believe what we believe. Uh, we need permission. I, it, the question is a good question because it assumes we need permission to do certain things. Uh, we're not uh, autonomous creatures that have ultimate self-authority to do as we please. We need authority. So that's a, that's a good question. Where do you get your authority? Um, so I like to ask uh, my neighbors here, I, my neighbors, I mean usually strangers on the street, um, you know, what's, your, what's your favorite of the four Gospels? Um, what do you most enjoy about that Gospel? I'll ask that to mission, LDS missionaries. Uh, do you enjoy reading the New Testament? And of course they have to say, yes, I do, I do. Well, what's your favorite book of the New Testament? And they tell, what's your favorite part of that book? And it's like, uh-oh, they're like tested, like, ah. <laughs> like, what's your favorite of the four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What's your favorite of the four Gospels? What do you most enjoy about it? You see what I'm doing again? I'm getting them to put something on the table to work with. What's your favorite of the four Gospels? What do you most enjoy about it? Um, and when, when a topic like the temple, or grace, or authority comes up, I'll say, uh, to your memory, what did Jesus say about that? What did Jesus say about that? And that's a question I have to really coax out more because people will say, well, um, I believe X, Y, Z, or our church teaches X, Y, Z, or uh, you know, God in, in, teaches this. Well, what did Jesus say about that? So I might have to ask that like four or five times. Well, yeah, yeah but... Like, quite literally, what did Jesus say about that? I don't know. Well, can I show you? Uh, do you remember when, that's a great lead-in, uh, when, you've, when you've taken maybe a few chapters of one of the four Gospels and you've started to really familiarize yourself with the stories, you can say on the street, do you remember when, do you remember when Jesus came down from the Sermon on the Mount and it was said of him, that he doesn't speak like the Pharisees or the scribes. Rather, he speaks with Marshall. Authority. authority. You're awake. Uh, I'm making sure everybody's awake. Sorry. Everybody's getting, losing, losing, uh, losing. Authority. Authority. Okay, wait. Uh, speak with, uh, Jesus spoke with authority. He spoke with authority. And as soon as he comes down the mountain, he touches a leper. And Jesus remains clean and the leper becomes clean. And then there's a Roman officer called a centurion. And uh, do you remember when the centurion sends for Jesus? And he says he has a servant sick to the point of death. And Jesus says, I'll come and I'll heal your servant. And uh, the, the centurion says, oh, no, I'm not worthy enough to have you step inside my house. Um, Jesus, tell you what, I'm a man of authority. And I tell my subordinates, go, and they go. And they, I tell them, do, and they, and they do it. And they, I say, come here, and they, they come here. Jesus, you can just say the word, and my servant will be healed. healed. And Jesus said, ah, I haven't seen such great faith in all of Israel. See, you see, like, I, it's okay to be a little goofy in evangelism. <laughs> Like, we're strange. We're evangelical Christians. We're historic Christians. We believe that the universe was created out of nothing. We believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. Uh, we believe in miracles. We, we believe that Jesus walked on water. We believe in the resurrection of the body. We're much weirder than we realize. We, our mysteries are much more mis mysterious than, than we realize. The, the, the revelation that we've been given by God is such a gift. Um, now, the world's weird. They have their own kind of weirdness and strangeness. So the question, the million dollar question for your life is, do you want to be weird like Christ or weird like the world? Do you want to be strange like Christians or strange like unbelievers and what they devolve into? So am I willing to be a little strange in my evangelism? A little goofy even. Yeah, well, I love telling Jesus stories. 
Jesus said, I haven't seen such great faith in all of Israel. Go, it will be done for you. Do you remember when the two men had a crippled buddy and they couldn't get close enough to Jesus? So they take their buddy on a stretcher, they go up to the roof, and they puncture a hole in the roof. How rude. And they Stop look. They, they, yeah, they, all the stuff's falling down, and they lower their friend down. And Jesus looks up, and he's so impressed by their faith. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. And that's when the riffraff in the back says, don't you know that only God has the authority to forgive sins? And I, I'm, I'm trying with my interlocutor, that's the fancy term for conversation partner. I'm trying to involve them in the storytelling a little bit because sometimes people do know the stories a little bit and they could fill in the gaps in a little bit. I can prompt them to tell the story with me or remember the story with me. And it, it doesn't feel antagonistic. I, I remember one time in Manti just doing this for like 45 minutes and uh, we're having this great conversation. These young adults have started to gather around and this young man just comes blasting in, storming in, and he tries to warn all the other Mormons not to talk to me because he says, this man is an anti-Mormon. He's on YouTube and he, he's against the church and he's going to teach you lies. And all the young adults looked at him like, he's just been sharing Jesus stories for like 45 minutes. <laughs> Bunch of lies. Jesus says, to show you that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins on earth points to the man and says, son, take up your mat and walk out. And I love to expand on that a little bit. When you were a boy and your father said, clean your room, you didn't say, by what authority? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't ask for priesthood papers or your birth certificate. There is something about the words of your father that sufficed for authorization. The authority to clean your room was embedded within the command to clean your room. And when your mother said, son, do the dishes, you didn't want her to lay her hands on you. Her words were enough. Well, when Jesus tells a man who's paralyzed to walk, your legs obey. Jesus was in a boat shortly after, and there was a storm, and the disciples said, Jesus, don't you care about us? We're gonna die. This is awful. And Jesus looked up at the storm and he said, be quiet. Be still. Shh. Zip it. Be quiet. Peace, be still. Yeah. And the storm obeyed. Jesus got to the other end of the lake and men who were full of demons said to Jesus, have you come to torment us before the appointed time? And this is, you, can, you can help me understand this. I don't understand it. They said, send us into those pigs. I don't, I don't understand that. And Jesus said, go. And thousands of demons entered into pigs, went off a cliff, yeah. precipice, into the water and drowned. And again, all the, the people of the town were like, please leave, please leave Jesus. Get out of here. All Jesus had to do was say, go. And an army of demons flees for their lives. Jesus meets Peter and said, you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Peter. I mean, what other adult in your life has the authority by the word of his mouth to give you a new name or to tell people what you're going to be called? That, if I came up to John and I said, John, your name's going to be Bubba. Like, just like, <laughs> like, I'm not a judge. You haven't signed any paperwork. There's something about Jesus where if he says, I'm going to call you Peter. Your name is Simon, son of John. You shall be called Peter. <laughs> Jesus says, come follow me. And tax collectors at their booth stand up and walk away and follow Jesus. Or they're in a boat with their nets, and they drop their nets, and they go follow Jesus. So in conversation, I've primed my listener with stories about the authority of Jesus. How would you say, questioning, how would you say Jesus typically exercised his authority in the four Gospels? How would you say, in light of all that, Jesus typically 
exercises his authority in the four Gospels. All Jesus had to do is say the word. Sometimes all Jesus has to do is say, go, or your sins are forgiven, or be healed, or be "Be quiet, (laughs) or you're going to be called Peter. So, my question for you, my Latter-day Saint friend, how did Jesus authorize his apostles to go and teach and preach and baptize? How did Jesus give the authority to his disciples to preach, teach, and baptize? And handing the invisible microphone off, what's the common answer you think I get? Jesus laid his hands on them and gave them authority to do so. He transferred authority. So I said, well, let's look at it together. That's a a helpful, can I show you something? Do you remember when? Or let's look at it together. That's the sharing. That's that, the, the declaring sort of built into the word itself, but my mode of introduction is sharing. Do you remember when? Let's look at it together. Can I show you something? Let's look at it together. We open up to Matthew, the last ch- ch- uh, paragraph of the Gospel of Matthew. Well, let's look at it. And if you're like me, you have a just ridiculously big street Bible. I don't use it at home, really. It's just for low light, you know, like 11 p.m. conversations with the eyes are weak. And you're like, okay, I need a bigger Bible. So you, you get it out and you say, I promise I'm not trying to be weird. This is just for like late night street conversations. This is huge. It's like, it's, like it's bigger than you think. It's, it's like an extra large grandpa Bible. It's okay. You don't need that. I'm just, put your finger under the text. Look at it with me. It says, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore. Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. So how did Jesus authorize his disciples to go and preach and teach and baptize? He said, go. Jesus, all he has to do is say the word. And that's a great segue into the gospel. Because Jesus, he didn't just say big things. That's like writing a check that you can't deposit. You know, it's like, Jesus didn't just say, one million dollars for Marshall. Oh, thank you. Jesus wrote a huge check. And when he rose from the dead, did not bounce. It was in the clear. When Jesus, hold on. When Jesus rose from the dead, it vindicated and validated all of his words. Now, on account of the finished work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. This is the end. Sorry, I'm going so long. Jesus says, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He says to the disciples in the upper room discourse, you are already clean because of the words I have spoken to you. He says in John 6, my words are full of the spirit and of life. And he says, whoever hears my words and does them is like a man who builds his house on a rock. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, hears his words, and believes in him, has eternal life. So I'm an evangelist, I think. I I like to do evangelism a lot. That, to me, is the bread and butter of evangelism. Are there a ton of other, like, rabbit trail stuff we go down? Yes, there's a ton of other issues we engage with. But that, to me, is the bread and butter. It's the meat and potatoes. It's the sweet honey. Have you ever heard the gospel summarized before by a born-again Christian? If not, may I... And I love to study the four Gospels. If you want, you can look at the LUMO Project, L-U-M-O. You don't even need the chosen. 
These are just word for word videos of all the four gospels. And you don't need to watch them. If you, got, if you have uh, convictions about images, just put the phone down and listen. Just listen to the audio of one of the four gospels and put it on repeat <coughs> and immerse yourself in it for a year and take those stories and those words and those sayings of Jesus, his works and to the street and share them like first century Christians did. All right, now we're going to take um, a 15-minute break. We're going to hand it off to Ed, um, and he's going to teach us about sharing with the crowd down at the Spanish Fork Temple. Thank you for listening. I know it was a long <coughs> stretch.